So looking a bit under the hood at Cisco AMP for endpoints, uh, it typically begins with taking a look at the file itself and calculating a SHA-256 checksum. So when we look at the file, we'll calculate a checksum and say, do we know this to be a good file or not? If it's malware, we know it's malware. If it's good, we know that it's good. Uh, if it's unknown, that's where we can potentially, if we decide to, uh, punt that file up to the cloud for analysis. So again, when we first look at a file, look at the signature, is it known good or bad? If it's known malware, that's because we've got a checksum that matches another file that we know to be malicious. Now, when we talk about polymorphic malware, this is malware that changes its file con contents or file attributes in such a way that it only needs to be one bit off and the entire checksum is totally different. So just by doing things like applying white space, by compressing certain portions of the code, by reorganizing routines that aren't necessarily important, by changing the name of a variable, um, you could do almost anything to that code in the simplest of ways and that checksum is going to be totally different. So what was previously a known piece of malware is now just an unidentified file. So this shows us kind of the flow that our, course, that our application is, uh, AMP is going to use when analyzing a piece of malware and trying to determine uh, is this something that's malicious. So a file comes in, we think it might be malware, we go, okay, well, let's take a look at it. We do that one-to-one -one comparison and we say, have we seen the file before? That can immediately lead us to a known good or known bad type of scenario. The next thing that we can leverage is called ethos. Ethos is sometimes referred to as fuzzy fingerprinting. Instead of using a checksum that looks at all of the code, we're gonna take a look at the application itself. We're gonna look at the way that it behaves and say, you know, does this do things that are a little bit suspicious? Maybe is it using packers or, or unpackers? Is it using encoders? Does it have chunks of code that are encrypted? Um, <clears throat> is it doing anything where it looks like it's behaving funny? So we don't exactly have a, a perfect signature for it, but we're looking at the behavior. We're looking for something uh, that's potentially bad that could be happening. Uh, following that, we can leverage another engine called Sparrow. So remember that they call ethos fuzzy fingerprinting, and they refer to uh, Sparrow as their machine learning platform. Uh, the machine learning engine within Sparrow gives us the ability to look at both known good and bad uh, applications, try to find common behaviors among things that are bad, try to rule them against things that we know to be good, and we're going to have the ability to make good guesses at what a piece of software might be trying to do. We can say we think it's bad because we see it doing these behaviors, or we're pretty sure it's good because we've seen it you know, following other types of actions. Um, <clears throat> all of this leads us to the, comp uh, the, the term indications of compromise. How did we know that we were owned? Oh, we saw this happening within our DLL. We saw the web browser writing to file directories that maybe it shouldn't have been. When we talk about device flow correlation, um, this is another uh, pretty exciting component. What device flow cor correlation is gonna do is actually work uh, at the kernel level. If you ever look at your software rings, uh, you know, we say that ring zero is the kernel and that's protected. So this is at the core of your operating system, you have your kernel. Around that, you've got uh, ring one, which is low level drivers that talk to hardware. Ring two, higher level drivers. Ring three are your applications, right? So when we, and you're the, you're the owner out here, or administrator, when you interact with an application, you go, hey, I think this system might be compromised. Let me run netstat. Let me take a look at memory. Let me take a look at open files and open processes. As you run applications out here at ring three, those applications need to interact with the kernel. To do so, they pass your other rings, talk to the kernel, the kernel needs an interrupt, it's basically gonna perform some set of procedures for you and return data. As that data is being returned, there's device drivers that could work at lower levels of your operating system. So when we talk about using a dropper, if you hear that term, that's a utility that we use to drop a rootkit. And then a rootkit, a lot of times it's just gonna work as a low level device driver. It's gonna see certain calls happening to the kernel. I might say, hey kernel, what ports are open on my machine? And what our driver is gonna do is it's gonna say, well, it means all the ports except for these. 
So when you or I use applications in a forensic sense, we're trying to look at a system and say, hey, is, is there a bad guy you know, doing something malicious here? The applications that we're leveraging for sysadmin functions, unfortunately, could be lying to us. And the reason for that is that you've got this dropper in there at a very low level that's handling system calls. <clears throat> Come back to AMP. AMP has many capabilities. We're looking at them across this slide here, Ethos, Sparrows, et cetera. The DFC or device flow correlation that it performs, again, is gonna be a kernel level view. So we're taking a look at what's going on within our operating system, and we're doing so at the lowest level. This gives us insight that we might be missing otherwise. What we're doing here is we're monitoring, and of course it's coming from Cisco, so we're thinking, what's going on with the network? We can monitor access to both internal and external networks. We can look at who it's talking to based on IP reputation data. Of course, we can look at things like URL and domain logging. Think about all the other intelligence from things like WSA, sender base, et cetera, that we can tie into that reputation data and say, who are we actually talking to? It gives us very rich contextual data so we can make a good decision about what's happening. Is this something that's hostile? You know, a lot of things, we talked about antivirus, they're all signature based. And when we go, oh, okay, well, this isn't just signatures, this is heuristics, this is behavior. People say that, but what you see here are all the layers, all the various uh, components that have to work together to give us that rich level of analysis. There's even something called exploit prevention, which is pretty cool. For anybody who's spent time uh, on remote code execution, RCE, you'll sometimes see security advisories that say this application, this product contains a vulnerability that could allow a hostile attacker remote code execution, the ability to run their program on your computer. So you never had Metasploit installed, that was just your mail server. However, because there is a vulnerability in Exim or Exchange or Curio, they were able to launch remote code execution putting their application in your computer's memory. Now your computer is running it. Cisco AMP's got a capability to prevent this. And the way that it does so is by playing some tricks in RAM. A lot of times what we'll do to perform remote code execution is do tricks in memory so that the attacker can push their payload onto your memory stack or into your heap, and then their code has to come back and point to this payload, which is pretty tricky. This is why we leverage things like modern processors, modern applications uh, have got ASLR, address space layout randomization, so that when I launch an application for the first time, we're gonna pick an offset and then build all of our memory addresses off of that offset to randomize it. It means make sure that everybody running Firefox has got Firefox loaded memory at different addresses. Historically, that wasn't always the case. So the way that ASLR plays some games with memory, well, of course, it didn't take hackers a long time to build bypasses for ASLR. So, of course, what we're doing is making um, some modifications to the way that memory is gonna be handled. And when an application says, hey, we're gonna put some things in memory, AMP is like, sure you are and it can adjust those memory addresses. And it's almost like natting RAM in a way. And what we'll do is we'll look at the application behavior and we'll see are there chunks of the application that are trying to reach towards those old memory addresses. There shouldn't be, but a lot of times when hackers build exploit code, they have to reference static memory addresses or a memory address that's being calculated uh, based on a certain formula. If that formula isn't aware that AMP is doing tricks to memory, they're gonna miss their calls when they try to, try to reach a certain chunk of code. Why? Because AMP's exploit prevention moved those chunks of memory around, and now it breaks the uh, piece of malware because the attacker wasn't planning on us being there. So this is just one of many layers uh, that we can leverage and kind of show you how AMP is gonna work to make your environment more secure. Uh, finally, uh, dynamic analysis. This is, uh, a lot of you might just think of this as sandboxing. You know, for those checksums that we can't make any sense of, we tried fuzzy logic, we've tried machine learning, we've tried looking at it, we're still not confident. I'm not, I'm not, not real positive what this application's doing. This is where we punt it to threat grid and it runs it inside the sandbox. The cool thing about a sandbox is going, okay, this malware may be self-defending, let's try to trick it out and see what it will do anyhow. A really good piece of malware would have to be built to bypass this dynamic analysis. 
So, you know, we look at projects out there like VirusTotal. VirusTotal is a free service uh, where you can upload a piece of software that you think is suspicious, and it's going to scan by 50 plus antivirus engines. Cisco AMP is not one of those. Cool thing is, when there's attackers out there, bad guys in the world, and they create a new rootkit, they create a new Trojan or backdoor, maybe a new piece of ransomware, they'll upload it, perhaps, to VirusTotal just to get hit by all these 50 AV engines. And if they all come back and say that you're clean, you know that that malware is good to use out in the free world. Now, eventually, somebody's going to be uh, suspicious. They're going to investigate. They'll make a signature for it. And that comes back to, well, you know, are we going to have a new version of our code or, or of our malware that matches a different signature just so that we don't get caught again? It's a back and forth game. But VirusTotal is a fantastic public resource to take a look at all the um, antivirus engines out there and what their capabilities are for identifying malware. A lot of times you can create malware with even, even like Metasploit, right? I could create a backdoor. I can define how I want it to communicate, um, build that custom executable, and even encode it in such a way in hope that it's not going to be uh, detected as malware. Again, I could upload it to VirusTotal, see what they come up with. And if they're able to identify it, I'd bring it back down and I'd modify that code or mutate that code in such a way that hopefully antivirus engines can't detect it. So really kind of like a back and forth battle. As I mentioned, one-to-one -one signatures, this is where we just create a hash of a file. If the file changes, so does the hash. So this works really good on unique files, but if that file is going to be altered in some way, we're not going to match on it anymore. That's where the fuzzy fingerprinting comes in. By leveraging both static and passive heuristics, we're going to look at the way that the application behaves. I'm not so much concerned about an exact string matching a checksum. I'm more looking at things that are happening within the code. Does it use an unpacker? Are there chunks that are encrypted? Is it checking that a debugger is present? Is it looking you know, at memory to detect if there's antivirus around? If I see it doing anything suspicious, again, it's just something I can leverage in the, this process of many checks to try to leverage an intelligent verdict. Remember that Spiro is what we call the machine learning engine. And this can recognize previously unknown artifacts. Again, we're not leveraging um, signatures here. We're just looking at the way that the application behaves. Uh, notice that second bullet point. This requires large data sets that are both clean and malicious. So we feed it files that are good, and it goes, oh, I know that this is what good stuff does. Oh, I know that this is what malicious stuff does. And the idea, the hope, is that when we come across something that's brand new, that Sparrow has seen enough good files and bad files that it says, oh, I've seen this before. This type of behavior is something typical of a piece of malware. Uh, Tetra antivirus. So you're like, wait, I thought AMP was the antivirus. AMP, for the most part, is a connector. It takes a device like your laptop, connects it to the cloud, it does all these hashes locally, but basically most of your intelligence uh, is here. What happens if you're offline? What happens if you can't do those checks? That's where we can leverage Tetra, and this is just really for offline scanning. If you look at kind of legacy antivirus products, think of like McAfee, Symantec, uh, Kaspersky, etc. What those would typically do is leverage almost all of their intelligence on the endpoint. So you do your install, and that install could be huge. It could be 700 megs, it could be over a gig, because you've got all those definitions of what malware is locally. And the idea is that if a logic bomb kicks off and you're not attached to the network, you'd be smart enough to see that. Uh, this is the engine that's leveraged on Windows. If you use Mac OS X or Linux, you're basically leveraging Clam AV Engine which is an open source antivirus engine uh, in the background for doing all of your scanning. You're able to leverage a lot of the analytics that Cisco has. You can still pump to AMP's uh, cloud. You're still getting some customized signature sets, but the actual engine itself is going to be CLAM, where it's going to be Tetra on Windows. And this is what they show, you know, just doing it offline, uh, you'd have about 500 megs of definitions, and then you've also got some temporary files that you'll download. So they say plan for about a, a gig of local disk space uh, if you're going to do any offline scanning. Uh, as far as enabling it or disabling it, this is something that can be enabled. 
uh, within the policies that you create. So you'll have different policies for different types of devices, maybe one for servers, maybe one for workstations, maybe uh, another for uh, devices that you're just doing some light testing on. Um, in that case, notice that the Tetra engine can be enabled as well as allowing definition updates. We mentioned exploit prevention. And again, what we typically do is take a look at the code and we say, is this code good? You know, known uh, to be good, known to be bad, or unknown. Unknown we do all of our tests on. If we say that this is trusted code and it should be good, it's gonna wanna allocate resources. So you double click the executable, uh, it allocates memory, and it says, I wanna structure memory in this way. Cisco AMP jumps in and it's like, okay, sure you do. And it basically redirects memory to somewhere else. Now the program doesn't really know it and it's doing a bit of magic or trickery in the middle. And what's so cool about this is if there is something that's hostile that tries to make a request to the way that memory used to be laid out, we'll see that and ideally we'd be able to catch it. So this is just what they refer to as exploit prevention. And again, when we see this malicious piece of software reaching for old system resources, again, this is our old memory addresses that are basically a decoy. As soon as somebody tries to touch that, AMP is gonna notice it, and that's gonna be our indication of compromise. As far as the legitimate code itself, it's gonna be working in such a structured way that it only part, uh, points to the new memory addresses. And again, we refer to IOC, this is indication of compromise. This is going, okay, what were the clues that led us to the conclusion that this is actually a malicious behavior. And a lot of times we'll just look at that order of operations. Was it files that were manipulated, registry keys, network connections? Uh, and again, we'll look at a timeline. This will very often give us an idea of who the first user was uh, that was gonna be infected. We mentioned device flow correlation earlier. And remember that it performs uh, basically four big tasks. Uh, it's going to monitor internal and external networks. It's going to filter based on IP reputation data. It can look at both URL and domain names and also dropper detection. Remember droppers are what we use to inject that driver that a rootkit will leverage. Uh, the dynamic analysis, one more time, this was sandboxing. And just the process of running that suspicious file inside of a you know, kind of locked container. Think of a fish by itself in an aquarium. And we're just kind of paying attention to it, seeing it, what, what it'll do, trying to interact with it in different ways to get it to go off. Um, once we analyze it and we can figure out that this is something that's malicious, we'll write a signature for it and all Cisco customers are gonna be protected once we identify that that file is malicious.